when the demonically supported legions of the Ark traitor Horus Lupercal fought their way through the solar system to slay the Emperor and seize control of the galactic throne world, they found waiting for them the Imperial Palace of Terror, the perfect inviolate fortress, the ultimate expression of the castle builder's art, Rogel Dawn's final word on matters of defense. A continent-sized city with every square inch sacrificed at the altar of militaristic utility. A bastion designed by the greatest defensive mind of all time to stimmy any assault, grind any siege to a halt, and most of all, buy time at every turn. Be it endless trenches, layered void and psychic shielding, kill boxes, overlapping defensive lines, anti-air and automated batteries, collapsible roads and bridges, fortress after fortress after fortress, wall after wall, stuffed to the brim with Titan legions, tank companies, Martian tech troops, space marine legions, and human soldiers ranging from specialist to conscript. Rogel Dawn had spent the better part of a decade uncountable resources and man hours, crafting and supplying this, the rock upon which even the armies of hell would break. But of course, there is no perfect inviolate fortress, no unassailable bastion, no final word in matters of defense. No matter how monolithic, and no matter who built them, Every wall has weaknesses. One such weakness, if exploited correctly, could transform the contest from a grinding siege of months into a traitor victory of mere days. It was called Saturnine. is by nature an exercise in delegation. No one human or even group of humans can ever truly keep track of the perpetually flowing complexities of battle with anything approaching real time. As such, almost every successful army since the days of antiquity has divided these responsibilities amongst many. The higher ups determining the general strategy, the warriors with boots on the ground determining tactics and making on the fly adjustments. This war was a little different. It was not a battle of human command structures, but a contest between biological computers with the bodies of demigods. A macro duel between a pair of creatures whose battle tactics, combat philosophies, and simple decisions were felt in every sphere of the war zone. Towering intellects that stood above even their peers had planned for every possibility and crafted infinitely transmutable strategies that flowed and adapted in real time to the movements of the other, the Primarchs, Perturabo, and Rogel Dawn. In order to break his brother's perfect fortress and force a confrontation with the Emperor before the remaining loyal Primarchs could find their way to Terra, the War Master Horus had given overall command of his forces to his pet architect of annihilation, the Lord of Iron, Perturabo. His directives for the Primarch of the Iron Warriors may have been simple, but Horus knew only the genius of Perturabo could achieve them. First, take one of the two major spaceports within the Imperial Palace continent. Second, use that spaceport to land Titan war engines and Mechanicus siege equipment to support his space marines and human hordes. Third, take the second spaceport, before finally grinding down the void and psychic shields around the inner palace, so that Horus could deploy the endless hordes of his demonic allies directly into the Emperor's sanctum. A simple, methodical plan, one that Perturabo knew would inevitably succeed. But there was an issue. If the Lord of Iron followed Horus' commands, the traitors would win, yes. But he hadn't really defeated Rogel Dawn, had he? The Praetorian of Terra would die. 
but it would be the result of sorcery, or the support of an eternally replenishing demonic army. Not the genius of Perturabo's plans and execution. Not the superior siege craft he had brutally beaten into his sons. No. It would not be his victory over his brother, but the triumph of reality-bending extra-dimensional beings. The scale and the perpetrators were different, but Perturabo could see this was the same treatment he had received his whole career. Others would use his genius to open the gate before swooping in to claim his glory for themselves. It would invalidate his victory over Dawn. However, it wasn't as though Perturabo could openly defy the War Master. That would mean destruction for both he and his sons. So he did as he was commanded. He took the Lion's Gate spaceport and began the flood of men, machines and material that would slowly sweep the Loyalists away, just as Horace had commanded. He made plans to seize the Eternity Gate spaceport, just as Horace commanded. To any who watched, Perturabo was the perfect, loyal servant of the War Master. But he had a plan. Extended macro bombardment of the Imperial Palace had created an ever so slight tectonic shift. This shift had revealed to the Lord of Iron a weakness in his rival's fortress. A crack deep beneath the south-facing Saturnine Wall. A point that if drilled into, would allow a force to quickly seize both the Saturnine and Ultimate Walls. This would neatly bypass all of Rogal Dawn's carefully laid defences, and open the way to the Inner Palace. Such an assault would have to be attempted without reconnaissance, as he could not risk alerting Rogal of the new weakness. It would also have to be a very fast operation that did not allow for defenders to mass. A spear thrust assault to the heart of the enemy. This wasn't exactly the speciality of his sons. The Lord of Iron would need the assistance of an elite decapitation force. What's more, he needed a proxy that could secure the resources such an operation would need. Someone to smooth the way with the other leaders of the War Master's Horde in a manner that eluded Perturabo. He needed a pawn to take the blame if this all blew up. Someone who could, if they were caught, frame this disobedience as mere eagerness to serve the will of Horus. The answer was obvious, really. There was a space marine who could provide all of this. If Perturabo was going to attempt to exploit the Saturnine weakness, he needed Abaddon. The War Master's favorite son, first captain of the Sons of Horus. Ezekiel Abaddon was considered by many to be the most accomplished space marine of the Great Crusade. He commanded respect, fear, and somehow even friendship all throughout the Traitor Legions. As such, he represented one of the few major unifying elements within the forces of Horus. What's more, as beloved by the Lupercal, Abaddon's involvement would add a layer of tacit protection should the unsanctioned operation come to light. If Abaddon was on board, surely it was at worst impetuosity, not outright defiance of the War Master's will. It also didn't hurt Perturabo's plans that Abaddon would bring the Sons of Horus elites with him, perhaps the best spear tip assault force still active within the galaxy. Realistically, the only force the Lord of Iron could deploy blindly into this kind of attack. Initiating his plan to win over Abaddon, Perturabo invited most of the remaining Space Marine First Captains to a strategy meeting. The Lord of Iron was pleased to see Abaddon had wit enough to spot the Saturnine weakness. And that same driving hunger the Lord of Iron possessed. To win this on their own terms, prove they were the superior force, not merely a delivery system for the demonic. Still, Perturabo needed to proceed with care. Feigning caution, he declined Abaddon's initial mentions of the Saturnine weakness. Instead, dangling the possibility of swift victory in front of him, 
and then leaving it to the Sons of Horus first captain to push the matter. Abaddon took the bait without hesitation, repeatedly seeking out and pressuring the Iron Warrior's Primarch after the meeting, just as the Lord of Iron had planned. Finally relenting, Perturabo set Abaddon to secure the forces they would need, and he would have to do so without alerting Horus, or leaving other important operations compromised. Still, it could be done. Abaddon had contacts within every legion of the traitor host, allies he could approach without having to use official channels. While attempting to circumvent the authority of the Warmaster left a bad taste in Abaddon's mouth, he felt that Horus was no longer himself, and the sooner they could finish this affair, the sooner Great Lupercal could hopefully return to his normal ways. Especially if they could seize victory without aid of the warp. Maybe then Horus could be convinced to stop relying so heavily on demonic power. Abaddon would need at least three companies of Sons of Horus to pull off the assault. He would need Mechanicus vehicles, digging equipment to breach the weakness under the walls, siege equipment and artillery for prolonged bombardment to hide their subterranean activities. And finally, he would need a force that could launch a large diversionary assault whilst he and the Sons of Horus breached the walls from beneath. Most of this the first captain had no issue acquiring, but based on the defences of the Saturnine Wall, a convincing diversion would need to consist of a minimum of five Space Marine companies. A massively potent force to simply conjure up beneath Horus's notice. There was, however, a legion that could provide it. A legion that while on Terra, hadn't really committed to the siege. Abaddon approached the Emperor's children. More specifically, he lent on his tenuous allegiance with Lord Commander Eidolon. A decision that paid dividends. The Lord Commander was able to entice his Primarch Fulgrim with Perturabo and Abaddon's plan. Fulgrim was growing bored with the endless grinding stalemate type of warfare that such a siege required, and the idea of a dramatic execution strike to end it appealed to him very much. Reasoning that there could be no better diversion than a genuine threat, Fulgrim offered not five companies, but the Emperor's children in full legion strength. A force to end worlds and shatter civilizations. All that was left was to enact the assault. <laughs>